Morant with a running start. Elevate! Oh, oh, it ducks! Oh, my goodness! Tie game in overtime. Gasol will turn his heat. It's good! It's Gasol Seven tenths remain. Only now with three. Count it! A 15 point play for Memphis. And Blake Griffin gets into it on the floor with Randolph. Hard to tell if there are any punches being thrown under there, but Griffin took exception. Adams going long. Morant! Oh, he hit it! He hit it! He hit it! John Morant! Insanity! You gotta be kidding me. Welcome to Grits and Grinds, a Memphis Grizzlies podcast. The Grizzlies lose on a Friday night at home to a heat team that was resting most of their regulars. The Grizzlies played essentially their regular rotation. Although there were some tweaks, which I'll get to in just a little bit. It was a strange game. I think you can look at the box score and point out some simple reasons for the loss. You lose the three point battle 18 to 10. You turn the ball over Way too much. The Grizzlies finished this game with 20 turnovers. The Grizzlies also missed a ton of free throws. They missed 13 free throws in the first half, which is comically bad. Uh, They do finish 30 of 45 from the foul line. But the bigger issue, it's not so much, sorry, we see those are the stats that express why we lost. But the problem is who you lost to. You lost to a Heat team that was playing without Jimmy Butler, without Bam Adebayo, without Kyle Lowry, on and on. Uh, Duncan Robinson lit up the Grizzlies for 29 points. He set what would have been a career high with 10 made free throws. Also, there were guys, borderline NBA players, deep bench players for the Heat, Jamal Kane, Jamari Bouye, who just destroyed the Grizzlies, and it was a weird game. Now, we know the turnovers hurt the Grizzlies. We know the missed free throws hurt the Grizzlies. The three-point shooting hurt the Grizzlies. But some of it also, it's that human element. I know Brevin Knight was talking about it on the broadcast. You see your opponent is missing the regular guys. It's a preseason game, so technically it doesn't really matter. You get up to an early lead. The Grizzlies were up 15 in the second quarter, And so at that point, you lose your edge a little bit. Maybe you let off the gas. You close the first half with a pretty ugly end of quarter. The Heat end up making a shot at the buzzer to cut it to two. And suddenly you're like, oh, this is a close game. And then for whatever reason, you never regain your edge in the second half. In the second half, you're outworked. The Heat keep making shots. The shots aren't really falling for you. And you end up with kind of... I guess an embarrassing loss. I mean, no losses in the preseason are super embarrassing. Uh, The Grizzlies pulled out their regular players with five minutes to go, you know, thinking, you know, it's not really worth it to push for the comeback. And that's correct. It's not really worth it to push. Uh, You still saw, I thought, some nice things in the final minutes where Zyra Williams made a big three. Vince Williams Jr. made a big three uh, in the final 30 seconds to, to make it close. But overall, kind of an ugly loss, but not a big deal. Honestly, I'm kind of a weirdo who in preseason, I like a defeat. Maybe uh, I buy into the concept that it makes you hungrier. It makes you feel less content. So you're not thinking, oh, we're we're awesome. We've achieved all our goals. Uh, I like losing in this fashion to a guy who basically earned a two-way contract with this game. That's Jamal Cain against Marcus Garrett, against Orlando Robinson starting center, a guy I'd never heard of before this game. So, Not a pretty loss, but we did find out a lot of things, and there are a ton of interesting takeaways. Before the game, Taylor Jenkins in the pregame media availability basically let everyone know he was swapping up his 10-man rotation, and he gave us the details. Big fan of that, Taylor. Uh, Keep that up. Makes my life easier. But they chose to remove on the second unit. They decided not to play Jake LaRavia and John Conchar. And they decided to give an opportunity on the second unit during the regular portion of the game while the game is still competitive. So the regular 10-man rotation on the second unit was made up of David Roddy and Xavier Tillman. Xavier Tillman, who had gotten a DNP purely 
for a coach's decision. There was no other reason he wasn't playing. They just wanted to experiment with different lineups, and they didn't need to put him in the game. So in this game, he got his chance. I told you last episode, I assumed Xavier Tillman would be worked into the 10-minute rotation this game, and he was. So we saw the regular starters, and then we saw a bench unit of Tyus Jones, Zaire Williams, David Roddy, Brandon Clark, and Xavier Tillman. Now, the way David Roddy was used off the bench wasn't particularly odd or anything. He was just a backup small forward. He basically played exactly Conchar's role into the first, start of the second, into the third, start of the fourth. The way Xavier Tillman was used, I did think was unexpected. It isn't exactly how I would have thought to deploy Xavier Tillman. Xavier Tillman played a lot of power forward in this game. He played a lot of the game next to Steven Adams. In the last preseason game where it felt like a dress rehearsal, the rotation of the bigs, the substitution pattern of the bigs, it was basically what I anticipated, where Santiago Aldama starts the game at the four, then Brandon Clark comes in for him, and you have a few minutes of Steven Adams and Brandon Clark playing together. I like that combination just fine, even though it's clearly starved for spacing. And I thought that's what we would see more in this game, where Brandon Clark would again play a little bit of power forward, and then he would team up with Xavier Tillman. Well, what happened in actuality was Xavier Tillman was the first big man sub to come in the game. He comes in for Aldama, and then you have these Steven Adams and Xavier Tillman minutes together. Then Brandon Clark comes in, so you got Xavier and Brandon together. Then Tillman comes out, and the next time he checks in, like to end the first half, it's all Xavier Tillman, Steven Adams minutes. They finished the first half, played six minutes side by side. Now, this is clearly a combination they wanted to try out. They want to see how it goes, and they got to look at it. Um, it's one preseason game, and you don't want to draw a lot of conclusions based on just the results of the score. But I, I don't know if it's notable, but I will note that those last six minutes of the second quarter, that's where the Grizzlies blew their lead. And I don't want to lay it all at the feet of Xavier and Steven. To my eye, they didn't do anything incorrect. I mean, the team was getting burned on three-pointers. John Morant and Dylan Brooks were on the court. Like, some of your mainline starters, they were out there. Just for whatever reason, the Grizzlies lost the lead during the Tillman and Adams minutes. But I found it very interesting that Tillman and Adams played so many minutes together. And now, after two preseason games where your main guys play where everyone's healthy except Jaron Jackson Jr. One of the takeaways from these last two games, the loss to the Heat and then the win over the Magic, is uh, the pairing of the big men hasn't gone how I anticipated. Brandon Clark and Steven Adams virtually haven't played any minutes together. They played a couple minutes in the first quarter against the Magic together, and since then, it's only been either or. In the game against the Heat, it was Steven Adams in, and then Brandon Clark came in for him. Then Steven Adams came back in, Brandon Clark went out. They never shared the court together. I find that interesting. That's unexpected. Another thing about the rotation that we have observed over the last two games that I think is notable is that they have found time for Tyus and Ja to play together in both games. This is, that's something I expected. It's something I put in my preseason prediction of what the rotation would look like, but the team is fully healthy. All your wings are available to play. They are still finding time for Tyus and jaw to share the court together. A reminder last year, the net rating of Tyus and jaw on the court at the same time was very, very good up until last season. I'm just not a fan of it. I mean, I'm still not a fan of it. Um, despite the success that it showed last year, I think it, it really opens you up to getting punished on the boards. It makes your defense not as good. Um, I don't know if the offensive gains make up for the defensive losses, but it doesn't matter. I'm not coaching. This coaching staff does seem to like it and has specifically found time to use it in the preseason, so I think we will use it in the regular season. The other takeaway, I think, from the last two games where we've gotten a good look at what a rotation might look like in the regular season there haven't been any minutes of the small ball lineup that several people theorized we could see. And that is, we have seen zero minutes of Desmond Bain, Dylan Brooks, and Zaire Williams playing together. We've seen no minutes of Dylan Brooks sizing up and playing the four or Zaire playing the four. 
I mean, Zaire's minutes, you could argue two or three, they're the same thing, but he usually comes in for Bain. So default in my mind, I put him at shooting guard. So that's what we've seen through two games now. I don't know how much the final two preseason games are going to resemble actual dress rehearsals. I would guess in Tuesday against the Magic, you know, maybe you kind of play your regular 10 again, and then the last preseason game on Thursday against the Pistons, you don't. I would say they're not going to play like Ja and Desmond and Dylan in both those games. I'd be surprised. I think one of them, you're just going to clear your bench and let all the backups play or let all the rookies play. But we'll see. And maybe we will learn more about the rotation, about what the rotation will look like come opening night. By the way, for those two preseason games, this is Tuesday night at 6 p.m. against the Magic, and then Thursday night, 6 p.m. against the Pistons. I will be doing playback watch parties over in my playback room. If you haven't done it yet, you can join in there. We watch the game together. The game is all synced up. So we're watching Bally Sports together, and then I will be there with guests uh, talking about the game, reacting to the game, answering any questions. There's a live chat that's going on. You need to log in with your TV provider to be able to see the broadcast. That's what makes it legal so we can all watch the game together. So definitely make plans to be there on Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m. Central. I'll be doing playback watch parties for the Grizzlies preseason games the Tuesday game against the magic uh we're not even sending our broadcast team so like Pete and Brevin aren't gonna be there you might as well watch with me um let's talk now more about the individual performances from this lackluster loss and we will do that right after this short break Guarantee your Grizz and get the season's biggest games, biggest giveaways, and best seats at a great price with 2022-2023 Grizzlies season tickets, half-season plans, and 10-game packs. Lock in your tickets to see Ja, Jaron, Dez, and all your favorite Grizzlies make big-time noise starting at $11 per game. Get your tickets now. Call 901-888-HOOP or click grizzlies.com today. Okay, as far as the individual performances from this game, no one stands out like no one had an excellent game where you're super fired up to talk about what they did. The thing that pops out to me is just the turnovers up and down the roster. I mean, Ja only had three turnovers, which is honestly pretty solid for him. But Desmond Bain with four turnovers, Dylan Brooks with four turnovers, Xavier Tillman with three turnovers. That's not going to get the job done. Now, Dylan, you could argue he's trying to be more of a playmaker. He said he wants to average four assists a game this year. I'm going to take the under. Not even as a joke. I just think, all right, three might be achievable. Last year was his career high. He did 2.8. I think 3.5 is there for him. But uh, this one, this game, he had one assist and four turnovers. And some of the turnovers, just terrible. He had a really bad run in the fourth quarter. It led to a three-pointer off an inbounds play. And, like, they ran some nice out-of-timeout inbounds plays. There was one where Santi Aldama fed Brandon Clark under the bucket. Love to see it. But there was, like, an inbounds play where Dylan caught it and immediately threw it back to Ja, who was the inbounder, and it was a turnover. I don't know if that was just a designed read, but it was, like, I don't know. He didn't look. It was a bad play. So the turnovers were rough. Dylan's shooting was good. I mean, 18 points. He made three out of six three-pointers. I think, you know, if you want to take issue with the shot volume for Dylan, I have no problem with it. If you were watching the game, he got wherever he wanted to go on offense. They were all good looks. So he finishes with 18 points on those 10 attempts. You love that from Dylan. It's the turnovers that are the problem. Uh, Desmond Bain, one for seven from three. He is now one for 12 on three-pointers in the preseason so far. A very frigid start from downtown, from the guy we're expecting a lot from this year. And we have to note those home road shooting splits last year. Desmond only shot 39% from three at home. I mean, that's an air quotes, only 39%. 39% is good for most people, but it's not good for Bain. Uh, on the road last year, Bain shot 48%, close to 50% if you count the postseason. So he's... Shot better on the road now for like a year and a half. 
I assume this is just a random slow start to the season. Speaking of slow starts to the preseason, Tyus Jones is now one for 11 in the preseason from the field. Not what we need from the NBA's highest paid backup point guard. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, Tyus has a very handsome contract. We need to see him get his floater game going, get his three-point game going. John ja Morant, I mean... What do you say? That was a that was a very subpar game for him. 17 points, five rebounds, four assists, two steals. You love him getting the steals again. Six for nine from the line. Combine that with his seven for 10 from the line in the first game. Not what you want. Not the accuracy level you want. The volume is good. And by the way, maybe contributing to this game, like, you know, you lose your edge, you end up getting upset by some guys who are fighting to make the NBA uh, there were so many free throws where, again, both of these games against the Magic and the Heat have been very disjointed, just a massive volume of free throws, a lot of foul calls. But John Morant, subpar game for him, uh, actually had a negative plus minus where the Grizzlies lost the minutes he was on the court. That's a stark difference from his first preseason game where the Grizzlies were plus 25 against the Magic in his 22 Minutes, and then Santi Aldama. I mean, did Aldama have the best game of any of the starters? He was catching all kinds of alley oops in this game, having a lot of fun. He had one bad dribble off his leg turnover, but Santi, I think, strengthening his grip and giving the coaches a lot of confidence that they've made the right call in making him the temporary starter for Jaron Jackson Jr. So it was a pretty good game from Santi Aldama. Stephen Adams. Once again, looking very, very solid, looking like he's in regular season form, actually looking to score a little bit. He had a nice little post move in this one. He contributed, though, to the missed free throws, which is one of the things he does. He's a terrible free throw shooter. He missed his first four before making his last two, finished two for six from the line. Uh, Zaire Williams was basically invisible in the first half. He did come on a little bit strong in the second, um, and I liked, again, that big clutch three he made, although then he missed his next two clutch attempts. One was blocked, and then he had a, he had a chance to tie it at the end. Missed that one. Brandon Clark with a weird three for eight from the field. Missed some easy shots. Just a lot of easy shots that you assume would go in did not go in in this one, and then your opponent makes 18 three-pointers, and that's how you end up losing. Um, but, like... Beyond that, I don't have a lot of grand observations or conclusions I'm drawing. For me, it's just the curiosity of seeing Steven Adams and Xavier Chilman playing together. I don't think we're going to see a lot of that, uh, but they went with that in this one. And then the fact that Brandon Clark and Steven Adams are not playing together, the fact that they're always finding time for Tyus Jones and John Morant, even if it is just a couple of minutes, and then you see the lack of playing small, the lack of using Zaire and Dylan Brooks. For me, that's the big takeaway from these two games. Um, the rest of it, just a random preseason game. You turn the basketball over too much, and you got beat by some guys who were hungrier than you. But next game is, like I said, Tuesday night against the Detroit Pistons at 6 p.m. Join me over in playback. Uh, if you're in the Memphis area, don't miss the Grizzlies of tomorrow when the Memphis Hustle opened their season against the Lakeland Magic on Friday, November 4th. That's at the Landers Center. It's at 7 p.m. The game is presented by Campbell Clinic. Visit memphishustle.com for tune-in details or to go ahead and purchase your tickets. Anyways, that's the show for today. Appreciate you guys listening to this episode. Make sure you go check out the YouTube version of this show. Tell other Grizzlies fans about it. Hope you're having a great Monday. Talk to you soon. Go Grizz!